Today we're talking about the Qin Dynasty and the Han Dynasty. We ended the Zhou, you'll hopefully remember, with the Warring States period, and the Qin Dynasty is the one that wins the Warring States period. Let's take a look at them. Here's the Qin Dynasty right here. Now, remember we discussed in the last lecture the three philosophies. You had Confucianism, you had Taoism, and you have Legalism. Well, the Qin Dynasty, they are legalists. They are le harsh legalists, and they very much disliked Confucianism. Uh, they wanted, again, everyone to be a legalist, everyone to understand that people are evil, so they need to be controlled by very strict rules that have a harsh punishments attached to them. They would, you know, execute Confucian scholars, they burned their books, they want, they actively tried to erase all history that dealt with period, uh, period, the period of time before the Qin Dynasty. This was very much their method of operation. This is a painting right here of the Qin Emperor, Qin, Qin Xing Huang Di, and again, this is him executing some scholars, you can see them down here on the lower part of the painting, and burning the books of those who disagreed with him. Qin Xing Huang Di was a very larger than life character. He again creates this repressive empire that uh, very harshly deals with all of his enemies or anyone he perceives to be his enemies. And he boasts that his dynasty is going to last 10,000 generations, which would mean that it would still be around today. And they do achieve some, some notable things. I mean, again, he ends the Warring States period, sort of reunifies China. He expands the empire. He conquers southern China. He conquers Vietnam. He standardizes the weights and the measures, the you know, wheel sizes in China, which is a bigger deal than it seems. Why is it a big deal? In a word, trade, right? It is easier for merchants and for people in different towns and in different regions of the country to trade with one another if everyone's dealing with the same weights, the same measurements. It increases trade between the different parts of China, and that increases prosperity. Uh, a postal service, then you know what that is. Uh, and an early version of the Great Wall. This is the guy who's sort of credited with starting the project that then keeps going for a long time. When the Great Wall begins, it's not as impressive as it is later. What you're seeing here are the ruins of an original portion of the Great Wall. So this is what it looked like. Now this is, you know, a long time later, so it maybe used to look more impressive than this little pile of rocks, but you can see it right there. That is the sort of original Great Wall built by good old Qin Shi Huangdi. And here's another portion of, again, the original. So this is the ancient, ancient version of the Great Wall that then you're more familiar with the more recent versions that looks nicer. And you see it right here. Oh, and by the way, before any of you asked me about that hole over there, it wouldn't have been in the original, right? I mean, that's, that's a later sort of thing. And here again is an ancient version of the Great Wall. I just like those pictures. All right, so the Qin Dynasty did not last 10,000 generations. It is not still around today. It actually barely survives the death of Qin Shi Huangdi. So he's this really, really ruthless, you know, good conqueror or whatever. So everyone's kind of too afraid of him to revolt while he is around. But he dies. And after he dies, there's immediately a revolts and peasant armies and a bunch of people who rise up uh, against his friends who are like, hey, you know, we, we still get to be evil, right? And the rest of China's like, no, you're done. So the rest of China rises up and they take him out. But, just a quick note, that doesn't happen right away. The Qin Dynasty is around for a, a couple of years after Qin Shi Huangdi's death. Not long, but long enough for them to bury him. And they bury him in this really interesting way. They bury him with an army of terracotta warriors. It's possible that this is something that you've sort of seen before or are familiar with. It's very interesting. This is where Qin Shi Huangdi is buried. They buried him with this gigantic army of, you know, terracotta soldiers. 
so that they, he could take them with him, you know, into the heaven to conquer heaven or, or, or something like that. And the soldiers themselves, what's very interesting is they're all made with a lot of care and they're, they're individualized. They're not just sort of carbon copies of one another. If you take a look here, right, the, the faces are slightly different from one another. Some have different hair from the other ones. So just as if it was a real army, every guy is different. So it's this extreme amount of care that was taken just to to bury with the former emperor. And it's it was, you know, found relatively recently. This was lost to history for a long period of time. So this is something you can go see, you know, in China and very interesting. And if you can tell from this one, you can see on the chips here a little bit, these guys were painted. I mean, most of them, the stuff has fallen off over the years. You know, it's been buried for a long time. So most of them are just, you know, brown now. They look like that. But they were originally lushly painted, which is, uh, it's a fascinating thing that they took the time to bury all this stuff with the guy. I mean, again, to give you a sense of the scale you're dealing with here, you see the, you know, real live human visitors over here, right? You see a big group of like tourists over there. That's the scale and the size we're talking about. Those are people. You can see right here, there's a person taking a picture. And this is the terracotta army that they buried with this guy so that he could be, you know, all big and bad, uh, even in the afterlife. So the Qin Dynasty is gone. I'll get to the Han Dynasty in just a moment. But first, I wouldn't be a good world history teacher if I didn't teach you about the Silk Road. And that is a caravan route across Central Asia. It links China, India, the Middle East, and Southern Europe. Give you a sense of where that is, it's here. Now, we call it the Silk Road, really it was many roads, but essentially it's from here to, to over here all the way up to the Mediterranean and Italy. It also existed by sea, but this primarily is the one, is the one we're discussing, this one right here. Now, there were many cities that grew up to service the Silk Road and the many traders that traveled across it. The reason it's called the Silk Road is because the item that would begin in China and would make it all the way to Rome was silk. The only place you could get silk was China. And the Romans loved, the Romans, especially the Romans elite, loved silk and it was a big luxury good there. It was very, very expensive. So it's called the Silk Road because the silk would make it all the way from China through India, through Central Asia, all the way over to Europe. It would change hands along the way. It's not like one trader would take it from here all the way to Italy. It would generally change hands from the Chinese traders over here, and then that would these guys would take it all the way over here, and then they would give it to some traders over here, and they would take it all the way back up there. The point is, is that this was the sort of interstate, or the inner country. This was the road that took the goods. And so this was the flow of money went from here to here to here to here. And many cities came up along the way to serve that kind of thing because when you have a, a river of money, there are lots of opportunities to get rich on that river. Here's a more simplified map of the Silk Road. Again, you're starting off in Northern China and you're going all the way through Central Asia and you're going over here and then you would take it on boats here up to Italy and up to Rome and up to whoever wanted the stuff. Alternatively, you could make the journey by sea. There would be risks to traders either way. The risks going on the Silk Road is that there are bandits, there would be thieves along this uh, route, so you'd have to take some guards with you to try to protect against getting all your stuff or all your gold stolen. The risk going by sea would be that your boat would sink. And this is just a picture I like of a Buddhist monk who's traveling on the Silk Road. Caravans that crossed the Silk Road would have looked something like this. These are obviously modern day people, but in the same, in the same region, in the same area. So after the fall of the Qin Dynasty, the next dynasty you've got is the Han Dynasty. Take a note of those years. The Han Dynasty does not only last for 14 years, those years, you know, straddle that, you know, year zero that we discussed in class. We'll, uh, we'll discuss that more when we see each other. 
The Han Dynasty begins after the fall of the Qin Dynasty. It's often called the sort of like a golden age in China. It's many Chinese historians' sort of favorite dynasty. Uh, the, the one emperor I want you to remember, a very famous one, was Emperor Wu Di. He defeated the Mongols, expanded the empire. He, you know, sort of made China safe from the people who were in the north who would come down and steal their stuff from time to time. And the Han Dynasty extended control over the Silk Road. And here's what I mean by that. So the Han Dynasty, they control China, which again is getting looking more like China as we know it now. They still haven't you know, conquered this area yet, but it's more like the China that we know today. The Han Dynasty sort of expand their control along this area here. And if you hopefully remember from those maps that I showed you a moment ago, the Silk Road went from here to like, ooh, and then all the way over to Europe. So this right here is that river of commerce, that river of money. Again, there's, there's a lot of important goods and important gold that goes along this route. So it was important for them to own this area so that they could protect the merchants from the bandits, so that they can make sure that people weren't stealing their stuff. So the Han Dynasty do that. They extend control over this area right here. Um, last but not least, the Han Dynasty create, uh, adopt Confucian ethics and create something called the civil service exam. This is a very, very famous thing. Uh, China sort of has a version of this today. Even their educational system, even their you know middle schools and high schools are based off of a single highly competitive exam. The idea was that anyone, even the low class, could take a high stakes test. This was a, a more modern picture of people taking the tests. There are people in these little rooms here, they call them cells, taking the test. And if you got a good grade, you could enter into the civil service and you could be a government official. This is something instituted by the Han that stays around and becomes an important part of China for a long time. And here's just a picture of the Great Wall in a way that you might be more familiar with. So for the Han and the Qin dynasties, I just want you to remember that the Qin dynasty is a legalistic, harsh dynasty, reunifies China, but falls very quickly because they're so nasty. The Han dynasty lasts for a long time, brings back Confucian ethics, expands control over the Silk Road, which is a trade route between Asia and Europe, and the Han dynasty creates the civil service exam, which in a nutshell is a very, very difficult test based on Confucius, Confucian theory that you had to take to become a high-ranking government official.